Dear students, welcome to Law Excellence IAS. Today we will be discussing the 12th report of 2nd ARC that is Citizen Centric Administration. Now, where is it important for you? GS Paper 2, GS Paper 4. And then SA. If your optional is public administration, these reports are a gold mine for you. We will not be deviating from our syllabus when we talk about these reports. And what is our way of study? I will be giving you certain notes and also I will be explaining you case studies which are being highlighted in this report and I will talk about the recommendations at the end. So in this case, the first is the concept of citizen centric administration. Now the citizen centric administration is intricately connected to good governance. So let's understand what is good governance. It is based on four pillars. The concept of good governance is based on four pillars. They are ethos, ethics, equity, efficiency. What are the ethos of the public service? That is service orientation. Public office is not an office of authority but an office of service and responsibility. What are the ethics? Honesty, integrity, transparency. Hit are the ethics. And then equity. You need to be sympathetic, compassionate towards the weak and marginalized. Welfare of the weak and marginalized is what we shall look at. Jawaharlal Nehru, he has clearly stated that the objective of the administration in its final analysis is based on welfare of the people it caused. It is not just about the rules and regulations. The end of the administration is to serve the welfare of the people. And then efficiency. And whatever the work you are doing, with uh, what cost you are doing that work. It means, are you maximizing the benefits to the people which you intend to provide for? This, is, comes, this comes under efficiency. When I talk about efficiency, I talk about use of e-governance. And then providing for simplistic rules, simplistic procedures, etc. When I talk about equity, I talk about uh, special concern towards uh, uh, weak and marginalized, protective legislations towards scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, women, etc. And ethics, uh, honesty, integrity, transparency. Here we talk about accountability majorly. And then service orientation. How we shall bring in that service orientation in the public uh, services is the question. Now in this case, we have core of the good governance. This core of the good governance is citizen centricity. Before you make any decision, think, is this going to be appropriate for the citizen or not? It means rather than inward looking, the bureaucracy is expected to be outward looking. So rather than looking what is good for you, look what is good for the citizen. So then, what are the components of the good governance? One is accountability, transparency, responsiveness, ATR, and then equity and inclusiveness, Efficiency and effectiveness, after that rule of law and consensus orientation and participation. So I call it as CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation for an elephant. Action taken report is been sub uh, submitted. It has led to cardiopulmonary resuscitation and then efficiency and effectiveness, equity and inclusiveness. So in this way you remember that. Why you need this framework? If tomorrow any department is given and they ask you to recommend how to improve this uh, functioning of the department, you need this information with you. The next is ethos, ethics, equity and efficiency. It has been discussed over here. Let's come to the summary of recommendations with regard to this. Functions of the government. If I have to talk about the functions of the government, I can divide them into regulatory functions, developmental functions. And then service delivery functions. So with regard to regulatory functions, what he says is, government organization should adhere to the principles highlighted in the paragraph 3.2.4, paragraph 3.2.4 while performing regulatory functions. So let's understand what the government mentioned over there. The first is, regulation only when necessary. It means that, Unnecessary regulation, over-regulation, over-legislation, unnecessary procedures, everything has to be avoided. Regulation shall be effective. 
Effective regulation, it means, in India, there is a bad habit. You make the tough laws and the weak implementation of the laws. When you are not implementing a particular law, obviously, it leads to a laxity and that makes the people to take the things for granted. So, it also provides for unnecessary discretion to the public official which may lead to corruption. So, that's why the second statement is, if you make a regulation, it has to be effectively implemented. So, supervisory mechanisms are necessary. Next is, self-regulation is the best form of regulation. What do we mean by this self-regulation over here? So, in this case, most of the times the government tries to regulate through its officials. Rather than that, why an individual cannot give, or we can do this way, an individual can give his own declaration of the things, and tomorrow if something wrong is found out, he is liable for punishment. Now, with regard to the building code, professionals have been involved. Let's take, if I want to apply for a certain program of the government, if a turnover requirement is there for my organization, a chartered accountant has to provide the for a certification. So, with that certification, I can go and apply for it. So, this is a self-regulation. Tomorrow, if I gave some wrong certification or I submitted for a wrong tender, then government can come and can impose a hefty penalty to me. So, the regulation to be effective, self-regulation has to happen. Above that, supervisory power shall be there with the government. And then, regulatory procedures have to be simple, transparent and citizen-friendly. Above all, citizen groups, professional organizations have to be involved in the regulatory activities. So, these are the recommendations given. Where we can use this information? In your syllabus, you have the regulation as a syllabus. So, regulatory authorities. So, the principles that has to be guiding the regulation, you need to have an understanding. And the next is, the third function of the government, we discussed about the service delivery. So, with regard to service delivery, this article talks about, recommendation talks about single window agency. Most of the governments have the single windows as of now. So, to minimize the delays, maximize the convenience to the citizens, single window clearance mechanisms have to be constituted. In this, there is a beautiful case study which was given from Germany. So, the case study is about multi-channel governance in the case of Germany. So, in this, all of them are being integrated. A physical access, phone access, web access, Everything has been integrated and access to the service is maximized to the citizens. So, this is what is called single window, multi-channel delivery, multi-channel government in the case of Germany. Single window, multi-channel government in Germany. That you can quote as an example whenever you are talking about um, single window clearances. And then, after that, he spoke about developmental functions. In the developmental functions, the first thing is principle of subsidiarity. What does this mean? So, every individual shall do the functions which he can perform at his own level. If he can't do a particular activity at his own level, he has to delegate it upwards, then has to move upwards. So, it means a, a function if it cannot be performed by a citizen, it shall be taken up by the local government. If he is unable to do that, it has to be taken up by the state government. If he is unable to do that, then it has to go for the union government. So, a bottom-up approach in the delegation of the functions has come up, has to come up. That is the principle of subsidiarity. So, this article talks about the principle of subsidiarity. And then, the participation of the citizens. Whenever we are planning for a developmental program, project, etc., there shall be a clear planning and participation of the citizens at all the levels. At all the levels, I mean planning, implementation and monitoring levels. And the third thing is about social audit. You know that the audit conducted by the CAG is not all pervasive. But today, we have the social accountability mechanisms. So, in alignment with the social accountability mechanisms, we have to bring in social audit for every governmental program. As of now, there is a social audit for the MG Narega. It can be extended to every other program, National Food Security Act. It also has the social audit. That's what has been recommended by Second ARC. And after the implementation of the program, there has to be an impact assessment. 
after every program implementation impact assessment has to be successfully carried out so these are the recommendations which are been given for developmental functions so let's recollect this principle of subsidiarity participation social audit impact assessment so what i can say it as subsidiarity participation social audit and then impact assessment it comes to ips square impact assessment participation social audit subsidiarity principle and now let's go to the citizen charters how they shall be made effective now what are the problems with the citizen charters most of the times the charters are prepared without any consultation there is no proper groundwork is done no clear standards are been mentioned in the preparation of the charters and more indian charters are been criticized as moral documents managerial charters because they are not been prepared in consultation what is a citizen charter it's a set of commitments an organization made to the people about the services it is delivering it means if you go to a government office if you want from some service from them what is the maximum time allowed to get the service that will be mentioned in the form of a chart we call it a citizen charter so how it has to be improved the first recommendation is one size does not fit all it means that every department has shall have its own unique charters and then let's take a break for a minute and start again so now citizen charters how it has to be improved in the previous session we have seen one size fits all approach do not apply so there has to be uniqueness with regard to the charters and then all the stakeholders need to be consulted this consultation has to be vertical and horizontal consultation stakeholder consultation is very critical and civil society has to be made part of this and commitments have to be firm why the firm commitments are necessary because whatever the timelines which are been made they have to be adhered to and the next is business process reengineering before you make any commitments change the existing way of doing the work existing work process and bring in the new work process and in case an organization do not fulfill the commitments we shall have the redressal mechanism in place and then periodic evaluation of the citizen charters it means the regular revision of the charters has to happen from time to time these have to be revised based on the end user feedback and there has to be a clear benchmark for this and officers fail to achieve the results they shall be made accountable for the same these are the recommendations previously there was a question on the citizen charters about their problems now if they ask for any suggestions you can just write these suggestions those are more than sufficient and add it to that the second arc has given a seven step model for the citizen charters what are they first what they say is define all the services provided by the department and second is develop a standard for each and every service for example if you come to my institute what all the services 1 2 3 4 i have to list with regard to service x what is the time i will be delivering the service what are the quality standards that have to be clearly stated so it means set standards and norms for each service and then develop the capabilities now i say i will correct all your answers but my time is limited so it means i need to expand my capabilities before i promise you something so raise the capabilities as per the standards you define for yourself and then comes the performance or implementation of the charter and while implementing the charter we need to monitor and regularly periodically we have to evaluate the performance of the charters and based on this inputs we have to continuously improve the charter so define and then set standards develop capabilities perform monitor evaluate and continuous improvement so these are all the things which are been important so these are about citizen charters which are been given by the rc now let's go for any question which comes up what are the core principles for making the governance citizen centric so first is any violation of the law it has to be taken seriously there has to be a zero tolerance strategy so just mug up these points every institution has to be proactive citizen centric understandable transparent vibrant responsive accountable and then the services need to be delivered close to the people that is called decentralization 
whatever the government does it shall be open to the people and civil services reforms why these are necessary what are the barriers to good governance if you observe the first are the attitudinal problems of the civil servants the second is red tapeism the third is lack of grievance redressal system and above all ineffective implementation of the laws and rules so these are all the questions in the case of civil services reforms and then ethics in governance so code of ethics need to be enacted etc process reforms it means that business process reengineering as the technology is changing we need to change the work process in the government and we have to move towards the simplistic work processes and the system cannot continue forever if there are weaknesses it have to be corrected from time to time so third party evaluation independent evaluation is necessary for the quality of governance so remember this a rule of law zero tolerant uh, strategy make institutions vibrant responsive and accountable decentralization transparency reforms ethics process reforms periodic and independent evaluation so any question that comes to you with regard to good governance participation and anything just remember this framework you can present the answer and now in this case application of these principles what they give you so business process reengineering that is the process reform adopt the modern technology civil services reform right to information transparency citizen charters uh, accountability independent evaluation of the services grievance redressal mechanism active citizen participation public private partnerships uh, these are all the uh, practical applications of the principles which we spoke before so these are the articles for today and these are the parts which we have discussed for today thank you very much and all the best now students uh, in this course what are the improvements you are expecting please try to give it to me i will try to improve them accordingly okay and thank you very much for all your support and beautiful comments which you are giving to me and actually that is motivating me to do these videos thank you very much and all the best